Yeah, so hi, um, my name's Claire. I'm here with Ian and Sonia, and we will be um, doing the technical side of the meeting, make sure everything is running. We are all members of the Collective for Climate Action, and you can find out more about the group by searching the CFCA um, on Google. Um, so just going to run some housekeeping with you, and then I'll hand over to Rupert. So there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end, and we would really like this to be an interactive session. So please do post your questions on Slido. As a remember, the Slido number is 642994. The talk is being broadcast publicly and recorded, so you do have an option to remain anonymous when you're posting questions. If you do have any technical issues during the call, please do let us know on Slido, and one of us will um, help sort that out for you. And um, we'd also welcome feedback after the session, um, which should have a link to provide some of us. So I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Rupert Reid. He teaches philosophy at the University of East Anglia and his academic work includes ecological and political philosophy. He's authored several books, including Parents for Future, How Loving Our Children Could Prevent Climate Collapse. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so I now hand over to Rupert, who will be talking to us about how we can adapt transformatively to the emerging climate breakdown. Thank you. Well, thanks, Claire. Thanks for you and your team for setting this up. It feels like a, a potentially important occasion and I, I'm um, delighted to be here. Um, I say delighted. Um, there's always uh, mixed feelings when addressing uh, this topic. Um, so perhaps I'll start on that note with a few words about uh, COP26, about which I have uh, extremely mixed feelings. So I was in COP for the whole time. I'd been uh, warning for, for many months that it was pretty much bound to be seriously disappointing. Uh, indeed, that is my reading of, uh, of what happened. Um, I'll just uh, share a link with a bit of detail um, about my uh, judgment of, uh, of the fundamental problems with uh, COP26 and with the COP process more generally. There's been a lot of spin, uh, there's been a lot of spin around COP, um, a lot of people trying to say, oh well we got some things accomplished and we'll be back next year and we'll do better. On the we got some things accomplished front, well yes, yeah, some things were accomplished. So the methane agreement, for example, I think is of some uh, importance. But really the amount that was accomplished in terms of commitments to actually do anything to make things better now or in the near future uh, is vanishingly small. And if you look at the pro-COP spin, most of it comes down to saying, we'll be back next year. And I have to say, after 26 years of this, that really is an utterly grossly inadequate defence for uh, where this process is uh, at. Uh, my judgment, along with the judgment of uh, a number of uh, realistic uh, commentators, climate scientists, et cetera, is that COP26 was uh, a pretty catastrophic uh, failure and that this was, as I say, uh, unsurprising. Um, we can talk more about that if you wish. I'm very happy to. I'm only going to speak for about 20, 25 minutes. So we've got lots of time for a dialogue and discussion. I'm really keen to, to deal with your questions and to hear from you all on this, uh, on this call how, how you see uh, the situation and what you need uh, help with. The key point about the uh, saying we'll be back next year and how that is inadequate is that so much of climate discourse and especially around the COP, but it's all over the place, is essentially a kind of deferral. It's kind of saying um, at some point this will be sorted. Uh, and often it amounts to saying something like um, we've got one more chance to get this sorted, but then somehow there's always one more chance beyond that one last chance to get things sorted. Uh, and part of my argument is that that kind of can kicking exercise cannot continue forever. So let's consider, for example, the words that our Prime Minister Boris Johnson said on the first day of, uh, of COP. He said, it's one minute to midnight. Well, let's take that at face value. If it was one minute to midnight at the start of COP, and what COP came up with was absolutely grossly inadequate, then it's not any more before midnight, it's past midnight. It's, say, five past midnight. And in my judgment, that is the case. 
Uh, and that is a very important conceptual shift to make. As long as we keep saying it's five minutes to midnight or it's the 11th hour, or it's one minute to midnight, then we never actually get to the point of facing up to where we really are, to the opportunities and chances that we have missed, to the hopes that are therefore no longer available and to what now is possible as we go forward. Once you admit that it's five past midnight, everything changes. You're in a position to actually face reality and to exercise real agency. This is the great paradox. What everybody seems to be caught up in is the thought that if we don't carry on saying, oh, we can fix this, we can make everything fine, then everyone will uh, give up and everything will be terrible. It's actually the opposite of that, it seems to me. Only when you admit that we've missed absolutely critical chances and that we are catastrophically late in the game, only when you admit that, you actually have the opportunity to exercise real agency. So it's the exact opposite of the assumption that is so widely being made. Uh, my argument would be, once we admit that it's five past midnight, then we finally have the chance to actually start doing what needs to be done. So what needs to be done? Well, above all, I want to mention three priorities. Adaptation, adaptation, adaptation. Once we shift to placing adaptation centrally in the frame vis-a-vis -vis climate, then things really start to shift for reasons I'll expand upon in a moment. Firstly, though, where are we at in terms of adaptation? Well, the Committee on Climate Change uh, report earlier this year on uh, the UK's scorecard on adaptation is really absolutely, makes absolutely devastating uh, reading. Uh, on most fronts vis-a-vis -vis adaptation, uh, we're nowhere. Um, and that is a situation that is unsustainable and increasingly dangerous as we go forward into uncharted waters. If you look, for example, at the weather chaos, the climate chaos of, uh, of recent years, um, you'll notice that it's hit uh, a lot of countries around, around the world very hard. So just to give some examples from the global north uh, from 2021 alone, uh, we've had uh, British Columbia right now being cut off from the rest of Canada by absolutely unprecedented floods, mudslides, uh, etc. Um, we've had uh, the catastrophic, unprecedented German and Belgian floods uh, we've had the ring of fire in the uh, Mediterranean uh, and we've had worst of all, most terrifyingly of all, the um, catastrophic extreme heat dome effect in uh, Western North America this summer, where temperatures went absolutely through the roof and were sustained for some time uh, at that extreme uh, height. That's the one that scares scientists uh, the most because well, that wasn't supposed to be even possible for another 40, 50, 60 uh, years. Of course, it hit British Columbia once again, um, uh, extra hard. Um, British Columbia temperatures reached 49 degrees centigrade in the heat dome this summer. 49 degrees centigrade in Canada. I mean, just think about that. Um, so uh, a lot of parts of the world, that's just the global north, obviously the global south, where there are often less resources to deal with these things, um, things have been on balance even worse. But of course, Britain has actually got off relatively light in the last few years. That won't continue. I mean, why would that continue? Of course, sooner or later, we're going to get unlucky. We're going to have uh, absolutely devastating floods or an absolutely devastating uh, drought or, or harvest loss, or whatever it might be. You know, we don't know exactly what it's gonna be. There's a whole slew of potential risks. And sooner or later in the next few years, one or more of those will hit us very uh, hard. So our lack of uh, preparedness is uh, a growing risk, growing with, uh, with each day. Now, if adaptation is as important as I say, if it is too late for a mitigation only, a mitigation centric uh, approach, uh, if we're in the era, not just of having to adapt to a dangerous anthropogenic climate change, but of having to cope with, uh, with loss and damage, which was uh, an important theme of this COP, although virtually nothing was actually done about it. Um, then the task of defining adaptation becomes extremely important. What does adaptation mean? 
So consider, for example, the policies of the Australian government uh, in the last few years. The Australian government, well known as having often been run by climate change deniers uh, uh, for, for a long time and, and still to some extent, in a certain sense, even today. But the Conservatives in Australia, the so-called the Liberals and, the, and also the National uh, Party, um, have made a move um, over the last 18 months uh, because it was increasing and is increasingly untenable to take up old fashioned uh, climate change denial and just, you know, purely uh, stick your head in the sand in that way. The move they've made is they've uh, leapfrogged over uh, mitigation uh, straight to adaptation. They've said, well, OK, maybe climate change is real, so we just have to adapt. Uh, there's nothing we can do to actually make it less bad. Um, and this, of course, is terrible. It's, of course, a, is of course absolutely vital to place mitigation, i.e. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction, etc., cetera, um, focally in our priorities. Um, but what do they actually mean by adaptation? Well, what they mean is things like, for example, if we consider a uh, flood risk, they mean building um, hard flood defences. They mean trying to protect the existing system as temperatures go up and weather uh, deteriorates and chaos uh, increases. Now, this is a highly brittle strategy. This is not going to work in the long term. And if that's all that adaptation means, then it's no wonder that adaptation has been a poor relation and got a bit of a bad name uh, up until this point. What is crucial going forward is that we have a form of adaptation which works hand in glove with mitigation that alters our trajectory and alters our society in the kind of ways that it needs to be altered anyway, that, we get, that works with nature rather than against nature. And that's what following on the lead of the United Nations and of some academics, the think tank that I've worked with for many years, Greenhouse, uh, calls transformative uh, adaptation. If you're interested uh, in finding out more, you can look, for example, at our um, collective book, Facing Up to uh, Climate Reality. It's a couple of years now, old now. It's just being uh, re-released. It's as pertinent as, as ever. It attempts to outline a sort of full spectrum set of uh, responses that would fall under the heading of transformative adaptation. So whereas the Australian government, the Scott Morrison government right now, is practicing defensive adaptation and trying to defend the existing system. Transformative adaptation recognizes that we have to transform, that system change is unavoidable one way or another. Um, what's going to happen is that either we voluntarily change our systems and prepare for what is coming, um, or we will be swept away, or some combination of the two. Um, there is no option of uh, continuing to maintain the status quo uh, indefinitely. Uh, that is that, that is simply not going to, to happen. So transformation is coming, but uh, hopefully the kind of transformation that is coming will be one that is uh, in some degrees at least uh, welcome uh, rather than one that is imposed upon us uh, and horrific. So transformative adaptation says... If we have to undertake defensive adaptation, and of course, sometimes we're going to have to, sometimes you're going to have to, um, uh, for example, increase uh, flood defences in cities or on, or on coasts uh, in the face of uh, what is coming. You know, there's going to be plenty of infrastructure. We're not going to want to give up. And a key part of adaptation is, of course, adapting our infrastructure. What transformative adaptation says is that if we're going to do that kind of defensive adaptation, then for goodness sake, we need to do it within a broader context of trying to create transformations that make it less brittle. So what, do, what would that mean? Well, so in the context, for example, of, uh, of flood defense, it would mean paying a lot of attention to upstream issues. Why is it that we are getting uh, worse and worse floods? Well, of course, it's because we're getting more and more extreme rainfall events, etc. But it's also because, uh, for example, in a country like the UK, we have a lot of uh, farming which is done in such a way that we are very poor at absorbing uh, heavy uh, rainfall uh, into uh, our land and preventing it from simply whooshing straight into rivers and whooshing downstream and, uh, and trashing everything. Uh, if we were to have uh, less sheep grazing, for example, we would be reducing uh, one of the uh, causal factors uh, that probabilifies 
uh, worse flooding. Um, if we were to restore wetlands, uh, we would be um, creating um, absorbent areas uh, to uh, to absorb the higher rainfall uh, that we are getting. This is the kind of way one thinks if one is engaging in transformative adaptation. How can we transform what we have? How can we work with nature rather than uh, against nature, rather than simply defending uh, the existing status quo, which is impossible? Um, how can we um, roll with the punches uh, to um, create as good a situation as possible uh, in the difficult times uh, into which we are moving. So transformative adaptation ought to be at the heart of everything uh, that we do now. It's a, it's a paradigm or a paradigm shift, uh, which can um, possibly more than any other uh, help us to cope with and even flourish through uh, what is coming. That's not quite all, however. There is one more very important conceptual shift to be considered under the head of, uh, of adaptation, which I also want to touch on briefly. And that's the concept of deep adaptation. What is deep adaptation? Well, deep adaptation goes one step further than transformative adaptation. Deep adaptation says, what if we fail? What if we don't succeed in transforming enough? What if our systems actually start to give out before they get sufficiently transformed? What, to put it bluntly, uh, if uh, we experience some degree or other of eco-driven societal collapse in this country or in other countries or in a bunch of countries uh, at once. And what deep adaptation says is we need to be prepared for that. Uh, and that's true, because that kind of possibility can no longer be ruled out. It can no, no longer be ruled out that the kind of emergency uh, disaster, et cetera, situations that we're going to be facing and facing potentially um, um, series of uh, in, the, in the years to come um, will amount to something which is impossible for our society to uh, contain uh, and there will be uh, potentially some degree of collapse. Deep adaptation says we need to be prepared for that. We need to be adapted for that possibility uh, as well. Uh, and it seems to me that this is now, um, while uncomfortable, um, unavoidably true. Transformative adaptation uh, is a very um, big ask and a bold program and absolutely essential, but it's not quite enough. We need to have deep adaptation as well, because if there is some kind of societal collapse and we are completely unprepared for it, that would be far worse than if we've made preparations for it. What kinds of preparations can you make for societal collapse? Well, you can make emergency management uh, preparations of various kinds. You can try to create various kinds of, uh, of deep resiliences. What are the kinds of things that we will need to recover from a potential societal collapse? Well, they include things like seed banks and, uh, and, and bio banks. Yeah, there are many other examples uh, one could give. There's also the question of psychological uh, preparedness. We need to ready ourselves for what is coming, including the potentially worst that may be coming. And again, if we don't do any of that, we'll be far worse off than if we do. So transformative adaptation is a huge agenda for what is coming. Uh, deep adaptation is also necessary. Uh, any defensive sort of traditional um, hard infrastructure type adaptation that we do should be placed within the context of those two uh, meta forms, if you will, of adaptation. So when I said our three priorities should be adaptation, 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 that was partly, you know, a little joke or a little nod to Tony Blair and others. But it's also actually a sort of uh, a kind of a list. Um, we need uh, defensive adaptation within the context of transformative adaptation plus we need deep adaptation. Three kinds of adaptation. The struggle to define adaptation adequately will be an absolutely central struggle uh, of the 2020s. Uh, and I take it that you guys that I'm talking to today will in practice uh, be tasked with uh, quite a lot of making it real. Talking of making it real, this is the other great virtue of talking about and doing adaptation. It makes the crisis real to us. It brings it home. So long as we fixate on net zero 2050 or even targets of 2035 or 2030, it feels like the whole thing can be put off, can be deferred, that the can can be kicked down the road. Well, it can't for the reasons that I've given. Adaptation 
is about something which is here and now or potentially pressing any day or any month or any year. Starting to do adaptation, to really think adaptation, to talk adaptation, makes it real, it brings it home to us. And in that way, it seems to me that adaptation is again a complete win-win provided one does it right. Those of you who are working on or thinking about mitigation, who've been working a lot on net zero 2050 or trying to bring that number forward or whatever, my argument would be that the, the actual best tool you have now, the, the, the best option you have now to really bring mitigation up people's lists of priorities to make it feel like an emergency is to talk and do adaptation, right? Ironically, the best way now to make progress on mitigation is to, is to make progress on adaptation because adaptation makes it psychologically real. It makes it present, it makes it here and now. And how do we concretize that? How do we make that making it real, real? So it seems to me that there are two key areas. There are many areas, but there are two absolutely key central areas. One is food vulnerability. And this is an especially pertinent one for the United Kingdom, because, of course, we are uh, at present grossly incapable of feeding ourselves, which is a, a deeply stupid position to be in as one goes into the moment in history that we are now uh, moving into. Now, of course, that could be changed relatively quickly. For example, if um, governments and local councils and businesses and landowners and so on saw a threat on the horizon, they could move fairly quickly to, for example, grow food on golf courses or um, stop the huge amount of uh, areas that are devoted to uh, uh, horse rearing uh, or for that matter to grouse rearing. Uh, and we could give uh, various other um, examples. But this is really not something where you want to take risks and have to see what's coming over the horizon. You want it to be the other way around. You want to have a real buffer. Um, the uh, grain supplies that we have in a country like the, like the UK are really pretty thin uh, when you consider the times you may, be, you may be moving into and the possibility of multi breadbasket failure. Uh, multiple breadbasket failure means the possibility which is growing year by year that we will get the world's bread baskets, more than one of them at once, basically conking out. So food vulnerability is, I would say, an absolutely critical area for, for many countries, but especially for a country like this one. And the second area I'd like to highlight as, as centrally important is the even more obvious area of emergency preparedness uh, and uh, disaster preparedness. Um, uh, and uh, that is an area where, uh, again, we are woefully uh, prepared. Um, and to, to, uh, to see that, you need to look no further than the pathetic level of preparedness that there was for a pandemic like COVID. All right, I'm coming towards the end of my uh, organised remarks here. Um, I'm just going to make a few brief suggestions now on the kind of things that uh, if you are um, at all um, impressed or moved by anything I've said, uh, you should be doing or considering uh, doing. And, and hopefully we can grow this list uh, in the conversation that will follow. So what should you do? The first thing I would say is, well, convene and, and spread uh, meetings like this one uh, in person, online, get systems thinkers, salient experts of all uh, stripes, um, climate scientists, but also many others uh, in to, to speak frankly about these kinds of uh, matters uh, and try to ensure that, uh, that department heads, ministers, etc., uh, get to hear these, uh, th that kind of frank uh, briefing. Secondly, I would say um, press um, your department heads, etc. What are their adaptation and resilience plans? What are their plans, for example, for helping to um, ensure the reliability of the supply chains uh, in the areas that they deal with, or for that matter, their own uh, supply chains? Um, and this obviously connects with questions of emergency uh, preparedness. And thirdly and finally, um, if these kinds of um, sort of more or less conventional maneuvers uh, don't work, then um, please consider um, things such as uh, blowing the whistle. Please consider uh, whistleblowing. Um, we need more of it. Uh, one route by which whistleblowing can be uh, painlessly accomplished 
uh, is via the um, Extinction Rebellion offshoot uh, truth teller um, who are set up for precisely climate and ecology related uh, whistleblowing. Please remember, please bear in mind that these, uh, and I hope this is obvious from what I've been saying, and I'm sure the reason many of you are here is that you knew it anyway, these are not uh, normal times. There is not going to be any going back to the post-anti-normal. Uh, um, if this is an emergency that we are in, uh, it is uh, a long emergency. It's essentially a permanent uh, emergency. Uh, it's in that sense uh, very much a marathon, uh, not a sprint. Um, and um, everything that is successfully accomplished uh, during it will make things less bad. Uh, every opportunity that is missed uh, is potentially fatal. And please remember that this is the one issue or set of issues that our children will uh, judge us on, uh, and they will judge us. Um, they will not be interested um, in what pronouns you use. They will not be interested in how much money you raise for charity. They will not be interested in 95% of what you accomplished in your day job. What they will care about is what did you do while there was time to act materially on the set of issues which are going to be determinative of the human future and determinative of the conditions in which they will grow up. That is the only thing that they will care about when they look back on, on your life um, at whatever point uh, they get to do that, assuming that they do get to do that. So yeah, that's about the, uh, the, the size of it. And that's, uh, that's where we are. That's what I wanted to share with you. I hope it's useful. And I'm super looking forward to your comments and questions. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Rupert. And um, we've got quite a few questions on the Slido, so keep posting them up um, and I'll just start running through them. Uh, so the first one, adaptation isn't as attractive to private investors as its benefits are so long term. How can we get private investment to pay for the adaptation we need? Mm, interesting question. You know, it's quite perplexing to me why there isn't more... Um, emphasis on money going into, et cetera, um, adaptation. I thought about it quite a lot. Um, there's some truth in what you say in the question, but only some. Um, the, the part of what makes it perplexing that adaptation has been such a poor relation so far is the fact that the benefits from um, work on adaptation are relatively short to medium term um, and relatively local. Whereas the benefits of doing mitigation are relatively long term and relatively global. In other words, there's a there's a tragedy of the commons, there's a free rider kind of issue around mitigation, which is not so present around um, adaptation. So given that, why has adaptation been relatively ill funded? Uh, and I've got some answers to that question. Some of them were already implicit in my talk. The most central reason, I believe, is this, that when you talk do adaptation, you're making the crisis real. You're making it real to yourselves and to everybody else. And people still don't want to do that, even now. And they certainly haven't wanted to do it until very recently. I believe that that is a critically important reason why adaptation has been the poor relation. Another reason is that if you define adaptation inadequately, as often it has been defined by those who have done some of it, like you know, I mentioned the Scott Morrison government in Australia, then, as I said, it's no wonder it gets a bad uh, rap. Here's a, a more, here's a kind of, uh, a different kind of reason why adaptation has, uh, has struggled uh, to date. Um, mitigation um, funding uh, that comes from the global north to the global south will offer some benefits to the global north, it will come back to help the global north. Adaptation funding will offer much less direct uh, benefits to the global north if it's uh, spent in the global south. Um, that, I think, is a, is a, a key political economy-based reason why it's been so hard to find the money to fund adaptation goals, let alone loss and damage goals, whereas it hasn't been so hard to find the money. I mean, they still haven't found it, but it hasn't been so hard to find the money to fund mitigation uh, stuff from the global north to the global south. So that's, um, 
that's probably another very important reason why adaptation has struggled to get the money um, it deserves. Um, but um, that obviously, once you explicitate it, is a pretty unacceptable uh, reason, right? That's, that's not a good reason uh, at all, uh, and nor really are the others at all. Um, I think that um, a lot of uh, businesses uh, and governments and other actors are going to be waking up um, pretty soon to the uh, benefits uh, for themselves and those around them in spending adequately on uh, adaptation. Um, I think it's th that that change is just starting and I think it's going to come in quite a lot uh, in the next couple of years or so. So I think there is um, a wave of uh, adaptation and adaptation finance that is, uh, that is uh, likely to be coming. Uh, and that wave needs to be helped uh, and it needs to be very much needs to be pointed in the right direction. As I've said, it is crucial that we place transformative adaptation uh, centrally. If we only do defensive uh, adaptation, we're actually deepening our um, longer term doom. Thank you. And um, so next question. Do you feel that election cycles contribute to the problem in terms of politicians leading hard choices when concerned about the views of their base? Um, the short answer, uh, yes. <laughs> I think it's um, absolutely clear that our current generation of leaders are um, congenitally inadequate to the, the problem that we face and that there's a number of reasons why that is so. But uh, the nature of electoral cycles is, uh, is one of those uh, reasons. Um, we've got a few encouraging developments at the moment. Um, full disclosure, I'm a member of the Green Party, so you won't be surprised to hear me say, but I think that everyone should uh, be considering the good reasons for saying that it is encouraging that we now have Greens involved in the Scottish government. It's encouraging that we now have Greens strongly involved in the German government. And there are good signs from both, especially from Germany. Um, that they are making and are going to make really quite a substantial uh, difference um, there. Um, but it's, uh, it's very difficult um, to carry that through as long-termistically as it should be, um, given the nature of the political system uh, in which we live. What does that imply? Well, one of the things it implies is the great importance of devices uh, that can be used to help to ensure uh, long-termism. What kinds of things do I have in mind? Well, the, within the UK context, obviously the leaders here are uh, Wales, uh, the Welsh Commissioner for Future Generations uh, and the way that the Welsh uh, have sought, unlike the rest of the UK, to continue the work of the Sustainable Development uh, Commission. These are quite um, uh, encouraging and useful ways of going forward. Uh, more generally, there need to be uh, institutions that are powerful, that are tasked with uh, acting uh, long-termistically and counteracting uh, tendencies in our democracy to short-termism. Um, I've argued for a number of these myself. Um, some of them are discussed in, um, in Parents for a Future, including the precautionary principle uh, and the idea of uh, having what I call guardians for future generations, which would sit uh, above the parliamentary system uh, and kind of monitor it for long-term uh, horizon thinking, uh, and, um, and uh, acting. Um, Extinction Rebellion uh, in proposing uh, citizens assemblies has again sought to find a way um, working within um, the democratic system in a broad sense of, of that term. Democracy doesn't just mean elections uh, to find ways of upgrading uh, democracy and implanting greater long-termism uh, within it. Uh, I think when we, when we look at the results of the the UK Climate Assembly, for example, there was a very good uh, BBC programme on it's just come out. I do strongly recommend it. It's called uh, The People Versus Climate. Uh, a bit of an odd title, but it's a very good programme. Um, when you look at the UK Climate Assembly, despite having really quite inadequate terms of uh, reference, um, it was really transformative, uh, quite clearly, for many of its uh, participants. And the results it came out with were um, extremely impressive, if only they were being uh, implemented. So that's where the question of, uh, of, uh, of power comes in. So, yeah, we need to find uh, ways of um, deepening uh, long-termism to counteract tendencies 
in our politics, in our economy, et cetera, towards short termism. It is challenging to, to make that happen. Um, until it happens, um, then we need to point out that, that gap and do whatever we can to fill it. Just going to try and feed on from that, Rupert, thinking about um, a quote from Caroline Lucas a couple of years ago saying that basically like the Greens have kind of been winning over the last few years because everyone's nicking their policies. So um, do you think the continuity of Green policies or environmental policies um, can still continue regardless of what party comes into power now? Well, yes and no. Um, of course, some policies have been nicked. Um, quite often what's been nicked is only rhetoric rather than uh, policies. Um, so like uh, it would be great if the frequent fly levy policy would be nicked, for example, which was one of the recommendations that the Climate Assembly came up with. Uh, but it, it hasn't been. Instead, we have a government which is still pressing for airport expansion and an opposition which is only in a very lacklustre way opposing that pressing for uh, airport expansion. So, yeah, sure. Uh, the. The Greens uh, are often, you know, uh, to be honest, you know, just uh, what can I say? Unsurprisingly, uh, uh, winning the uh, debate and being proved right over and over again. Um, but the extent to which that's translating into actual policy change is still far more limited than it should be, especially uh, in a country like uh, the UK with our absurd uh, electoral system. Um, I think that... Um, I think that we've also got to take account of the extent to which we've got difficulties in terms of uh, polarization, in terms of um, destructive social media, uh, the kinds of effects that you've seen around uh, Trump in the United States, for example, but it's far more widespread uh, than that. And we've totally had it uh, in the UK uh, as well. Um, that, that kind of growth of a certain kind of populism can make uh, some of this uh, policy work um, uh, more difficult. Um, what's the answer to that? Uh, it, that's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very challenging and you know, it goes far beyond the, the, the remit of civil servants or even to some extent of, of, of government. But it's got partly to do, in my opinion, with, um, with telling the truth and with uh, authenticity. One of the main reasons why people are tempted by post-truth nonsense is that they think that uh, the politicians and the media and experts uh, are not being um, frank with them. Um, and when greater frankness uh, and truth-telling and congruence and resonance is achieved, then the underlying driving forces in favor of destructive forms of populism will be reduced. So that's one reason why I think the kind of uh, spirit that Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion uh, have been prominent in bringing to um, our public discourses in the past few years, one reason why I think that is very, very important and it needs to be taken more seriously and sort of built on really by, uh, by, by government, by public information, uh, et cetera. The more that um, public trust can be regained, the less there will be tendencies for destructive forms of populism that undermine uh, the viability of green type policies. Thank you. And so next question, how much time do we have left at our current pace until we've committed to going over four degrees when accounting for tipping points? Uh, right. OK, so that's a, a, a tricky one um, because, uh, you know, hopefully four degrees is some time off. <laughs> um, what I'll start off by saying is that um, I've made the argument that um, COP26 is the death knell for 1.5 degrees. Um, Alex Sharma, in a relatively unguarded moment on the last day of COP, um, said uh, the pulse of 1.5 degrees is weak. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one can translate that into basically saying it's dead. Um, and uh, Climate Action Tracker says, uh, you know, realistically, we're on course for something like uh, uh, 2.7 degrees. There are various other estimates out there. There's still all sorts of uncertainties. You know, we still we know more about climate sensitivity than we did in the past, but we still don't know everything about it by any means. And as the question says, um, we've got uh, tipping points to reckon with, and there are in inherent profound uncertainties uh, uh, with those. Um, 
so so two things I would say, firstly I would say anyone who gives it too precise an answer to the kind of question that you've asked is almost certainly saying more than anybody really knows but that should not be used as a justification for just saying oh well we don't know then do we uh, because actually the attitude we should be taking is a fundamentally precautionary uh, one um, we are uh, in a situation where there are still wide uncertainties uh, as to uh, as to how quickly and how uh, badly we're going to um, uh, break through these temperature uh, barriers and that is a reason for being less reckless and for making more rapid reductions in our greenhouse gas emissions and for putting greater efforts into transformative adaptation and so forth because we don't know uh, and that and when you don't know you have to put your your top um, priority into guarding against worst case uh, outcomes because they're the, they're the potential worst cases um, and uh, and the other point um, I would make uh, uh, about this is that in terms of if you are asking me for sort of my guess, and that's all it can be really, you know, an informed guess based on the climate science, based on systems thinking, et cetera. If you're asking me for my informed guess as to uh, what is gonna happen, uh, I am pretty skeptical that we are gonna manage to um, keep with below um, uh, three degrees of global overheat uh, this century. Um, and I think that is likely to be enough to uh, finish uh, most uh, currently extant human civilizations. I don't think four degrees is required. I think three degrees is likely to be required because of the, because of, just consider the extreme chaos of all, of all kinds that we're already facing at just 1.1, 1.2 degrees. And the process of course is, uh, is geometric, right? Two degrees of overheat is roughly three times as bad as one degree. Uh, three degrees of overheat is roughly six times as bad as one one degree. Um, you know, think about things like the the heat dome this year. Like I say, that's just off the scale in terms of what was supposed to be happening. So where are we going to be in a in a generation's time? Are we going to be getting heat domes like that in the UK? Yeah, quite possibly. Um, or you know, of course, we could also crash into a Siberian climate here, ironically, because the Gulf Stream is is uh, slowing down. You know, there, there are deep uncertainties. Uh, deep uncertainties here but yeah my um my hunch uh is that the probability is that we're heading for um about uh, three degrees within the lifetime of uh, of some of us uh on this call and i don't think our civilizations can survive that so either there's going to be extraordinary brilliant uh transformations or we're going to face widespread collapse or some combination of the two and you know that's yeah, that should focus our minds around the necessity for transformative and deep adaptations. Thanks. Um, so a link between your moderate flank proposal and the potential of existing religious communities, can these mobilize and galvanize at scale? Wow, what a lovely question. This is obviously a question from someone <laughs> who has taken a, a real interest in my work, which I appreciate, thank you. But I should briefly explain to others here what this moderate flank uh, idea is, because we haven't actually mentioned that explicitly so far. So uh, I helped to launch Extinction Rebellion and uh, spent a couple of years, possibly the best years of my life, although I'm having a pretty good time now and I'm not depressed about the results of the COP and so on. Um, in uh, in Extinction Rebellion, and if you want to know more, you can read this little book, uh, Extinction Rebellion, Insights from the Inside. I'll, I'll put a, a link to that where you can find that for, for free um, in the chat in a second. Um, and um, I think Extinction Rebellion uh, did brilliant work, especially uh, in um, spring 2019, uh, in really permanently changing uh, climate and ecological consciousness in this country. And it did that by deliberately being a radical flank. I deliberately went further, even than Greenpeace had gone, in terms of doing mass um, confrontational, polarizing, nonviolent direct action, uh, absolutely fully uh, nonviolently, and in a, in a way which was designed to try to uh, be open to people of all sorts of politics and opinions and so forth but that was very, very determined about why, what it was doing and why it was doing it. Um, I now believe that the scope for further um, breakthroughs from such a radical flank is limited. 
Uh, and I think we've seen that in the failure of uh, Insulate Britain uh, over recent uh, months. And so I've argued instead for what I'm calling a moderate flank, moderate flank meaning moderate relative to Extinction Rebellion, which, which has uh, been uh, game changing. So it doesn't mean sort of middle of the road or you know wet or anything like that. Uh, what it means is um, not going quite as far as Extinction Rebellion have gone, trying to be more genuinely inclusive of people uh, for example, who don't want to be uh, arrested. Um, so I've made suggestions like um, that uh, we should uh, have widespread um, determined uh, action to transform our workplaces. Uh, and if that action gets resisted, then people should consider uh, short work stoppages. After all, if our children can uh, go on strike, then uh, why can't the, the rest of us? Uh, and similar kind of ideas for uh, for. Uh, transformative um, resilience building and community building, uh, whether or not you have the local council or whoever uh, behind you. That's the kind of thing I mean by the by the moderate flank. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, well, I think if there is going to be the kind of transformation that we need over this decade, then the most likely vector for it is something like this uh, moderate flank. Uh, and the My Parents for a Future proposal is part of the the moderate flank uh, idea. Um, I imagine, um, as I say, parents uh, mirroring what their children have done so far. Uh, and I think that could be transformative. And the question asks, can that apply in the religious sphere? Um, and I'm very interested in this question. My work is actually moving more into uh, the domain of um, green religion and eco uh, spirituality. And I was just as it happens talking this morning with someone very senior in the uh, in the British Roman Catholic uh, Church uh, about um, uh, how um, established religions um, can help to midwife this kind of moderate flank type uh, transformation. So the short answer to the question is, yeah, I'm enthusiastic about this kind of idea. I think that um, we, need, we need everything. We need a full spectrum change and we need everyone who is willing to step up and go a little further than being a member of the National Trust or Friends of the Earth even, and or the Green Party even, uh, and, and go a little further in terms of what they're prepared to commit to trying to achieve the kind of changes that we direly need together, and that many of which are gonna to have to be achieved in a quasi bottom-up way because governments are not leading sufficiently. And so, yeah, I think that should include uh, religious uh, organizations. And I think there is, um, there is real scope and possibility for that. The, the Pope's uh, Laudato C document uh, about um, environmental, um, uh, the environmental crisis, environmental transformation is an absolutely magnificent work, which I strongly recommend to anyone with any interest uh, in this area, but it's not the only example. Um, there are uh, a number of ways, I believe, in which uh, it is possible and necessary that people could find uh, meaning and, uh, and um, grounding uh, in spiritual uh, and religious traditions for the kind of uh, challenging transformatory, transformatory work that now needs to be done. If I could just ask the next question, Claire, because I've got one that kind of ties in with it a little bit. And the question is, what are the odds of us um, having the technology in time to reverse everything? Um, and, and my thinking now, I've been listening to a lot of energy analysts talk about, you know, where we are um, and the, the trajectory of like the, the fall of cost um, for renewables. And, and now we've got, you know, we've got not just got the economic incentive, we've got like a logistical and, you know, with the Pope's encyclical, you know, like a moral incentive to do these things. Um, and it feels like we are at a point where society has tipped. Um, and it looks like industry is starting to move towards or, or finance is starting to move, move towards a sensible option of, of decarbonizing. Um, do you think that we could see a massive acceleration that might help us avert that um, collapse and those three degrees? Yeah, I think it's I think it's possible. This is one reason why I am, uh, unlike some of my colleagues, not just kind of focusing fairly single mindedly on deep adaptation. Um, uh, I regard uh, transformation without collapse as still a possibility. Uh, I can't say I believe it's particularly likely, but I think it's possible. And therefore, uh, it, it very much ought to be aimed at because it'd be so much better. Um, and clearly one part of that, it's only one part of it, but one very important part of that is the kinds of technological changes that have just been uh, mentioned. Obviously, the uh, the growth of renewables, the crashing price of uh, 
of, uh, of wind power and solar power is hugely uh, encouraging. We do need to look uh, clearly, uh, clear-mindedly at all of this, though. We need to notice, for example, that so far, renewable energy has replaced very little um, fossil energy. It's mostly been additional to it, and that doesn't really help. Um, we are actually going to have to phase down, phase down uh, and phase out uh, fossil uh, energy if we're really going to uh, make progress uh, on this front and, and not still head towards collapse. We also need to be careful at the potential environmental costs of renewable energy and technological change uh, more generally. So um, the mining of rare earths, for example, is, a, is an issue. I'm very concerned at the moment by the potential that there's going to be a huge push to engage in a great deal of deep sea mining uh, to provide the materials for uh, electric cars. That would be probably deeply catastrophic. The ocean is incredibly disturbed and it's most of our planet and we don't take it and its protection nearly seriously enough. Um, we oughtn't to be trying to replace our existing vehicle fleet with another like-for-like -like fleet that is electric. That is not nearly enough of a, of a systemic transformative change. We ought to be systematically reducing the need to travel. We ought to be relocalizing. And I, in fact, I would go so far as to say that the future most definitely, once again, will be more local. The only question is how we get there. In other words, will it be more local because we have chosen that path or will it be more local because, well, after a society collapses, it's more local. Um, it's possible that the, co the coronavirus crisis may be pointing us in the right direction here, right? So uh, one of the potential lasting benefits is a massive reduction uh, in commuting, a massive reduction in air travel. We, we must never return to the levels of air travel that we've had before, let alone the levels that governments and the air industry are themselves uh, uh, projecting. Um, and in terms of um, uh, electric vehicles, we ought to be thinking of a future in which there are fleets of electric vehicles which are not mainly privately owned and which are primarily a kind of a quite shared or parts of a public transport system within, as I say, the context of um, uh, a reduced uh, need to travel. Now, if we go down that path, then these kinds of technological changes could be enough to be part of a, of a viable, decent, uh, transformed future. Um, if we try to carry on uh, having the same level of energy use that we've currently got only from renewable sources or the same level of, of transport that we've currently got only uh, from uh, renewable electric, et cetera, sources, then we're, we're simply heading um, toward collapse by a slightly longer route. Um, so we've got about seven minutes left and quite a few questions. Um, so just get on with the next one. Um, how do we convert the rich and their vested interests that seem to control so much and obviously don't want to sacrifice their extensive wealth? Yeah, absolutely crucial question. Um, I would say that the first thing to understand here is that uh, once again, the, the future will be um, more equal. It's just a question of how we get there. Um, now, I, when I say that, I, I'm not meaning to deny the possibility that there, were, there are very um, unequal um, uh, short to medium term futures, even worse than we've currently got. Um, what I mean is that uh, if high levels of inequality persist, persist for a long period of time, uh, it is clear that that's one of the main um, routes towards collapse. Uh, um, part of the reason for that is that um, the super rich tend to be to some extent insulated against uh, collapse. So the pattern historically is that um, they um, take from the uh, from the poor um, uh, as uh, collapse gets closer and they are uh, therefore um, uh, uh, not uh, needing or feeling the need to move themselves uh, until uh, you're so far off the cliff that you can't um, pull back. Um, so the future will be um, less uh, unequal. It's just a question of whether we get there through um, intelligence and consent or through um, uh, brute force imposed by an enraged uh, nature. Um, 
how are we to argue for this? Is this necessarily a matter of being leftist or anti-capitalist uh, in terms of our approach? Well, I, I argue that it isn't. Um, I argue that the, what we should place centrally here actually is the nature of the emergency uh, and the, the fact uh, that there is no way through this emergency which preserves the extreme levels of inequality uh, that we currently have. And I think a very useful precedent here is the Second World War, right? So in the Second World War, uh, you had food rationing, for example, right, crucially. Uh, and um, food rationing was a massive egalitarian device. Uh, and uh, UK became a lot more equal as a country during the Second World War and, of course, afterwards for a while. Um, and that's part of the reason, uh, actually, why uh, people's memories of the Second World War are quite happy, despite the terrible hardships many had to endure. And, you know, the fact that many people were dying and being injured uh, uh, and so forth. Um, food rationing was not brought in as a left wing measure. Right. Food rationing was brought in by uh, a national government because of the nature of the emergency that was being faced. It was a question of survival. So somewhat similarly, we should be looking at carbon rationing. We should be looking at actually, frankly, at food rationing, at least in a preparatory uh, uh, way. Um, but we should be doing so not because we're saying, look, everybody has to be left wing or something uh, or rich people are horrible. We should be doing so because this is the only way we get to get through this. So if we're serious at all about all being in this together, um, there is no way that we get to get through this with the uh, with the super rich um, pretending to uh, escape and fantasizing about going off to live on, on Mars or, or whatever. We only get to get through this if we actually share uh, the wealth more uh, and plan for uh, the emergency that we're in and the greater emergency uh, uh, that is coming. Uh, and that, I think, is a kind of useful and hopeful basis on which to go forward. I see little prospect of... Um, uh, sort of successful uh, left anti-capitalist revolution in the next uh, several years uh, in countries like the UK or for that matter uh, in most countries uh, in the world. But I think it's more imaginable that the kind of approach I just sketched where we think, OK, or how do we actually get this sorted uh, such that we don't all get to uh, collapse together? Uh, I, I find it more feasible to imagine that we might decide to act uh, on that kind of basis uh, and therefore decide with a certain amount potentially of consent even uh, from, the, uh, from the very rich to create a more equal society. I think one of the ways that starts is we need some defections. We need some uh, defections um, from... Um, the super rich and potentially also from uh, centrist or, or, or right wing uh, political forces of people who uh, recognize uh, that this is not any time to hold on to their wealth or hold on to traditional ideologies at, at all costs. And I think it would be super helpful if, if people on the left were to approach this matter in the kind of slightly sort of um, post ideological uh, emergency based way that I just tried to sketch. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Reaper. That's um, that's that's time for us now. Um, it's really good to have um, a different perspective um, on how to address the climate crisis um, and thinking about adaptation is a conversation that needs to be had a lot more widely. Um, it's one of the things that we're trying to push and um, we found you through um, Cadence Roundtable or we made, made a contact with you through Cadence Roundtable um, yeah. and they're doing some great work on that. So um, we try and promote their events too. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's really it's really good to have more of a focus on that side of things instead of it just being about mitigation now, because obviously we need to be preparing for a very few, even in the best case scenario, a very tough few decades um, yes. ahead of us um, yes. to yeah to get to get through. Um, so thank thank you very much um, for oh, all yeah. you said. Great questions, thank you. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit about the CFCA and the Cross Government Climate Hub, just to echo um, some of the stuff that Rupert was saying about. Um, thinking about adaptation, but how, how we need to collaborate um, to you know really get through this um, this situation that we're in. Um, and obviously, we've got the Cross Government Climate Hub, um, and it's for government members all over the UK. And we have members from the civil service, DEFRA, National Health Service, over 150 councils. Um, and it's not just a, a space for people in the collective climate action; it's a space for anyone in the public sector who is in a volunteer group at home or at work. Um, so please do join us on there. 